So uh, good uh, evening, everybody, and thanks, uh, um, David, for the invite. Uh, just uh, on the way of some disclosures, I have been, uh, along with uh, Dr. Klotz and a variety of other uh, colleagues, we have been running a high-intensity focus ultrasound unit for about uh, six or seven years now. And I'll share with you a little of our evolution, but also uh, where we are. And for those of you who are not that familiar, I'll give you a little bit of a primer on, on how this all works. As I usually tell my patients when they have prostate cancer, is that the prostate lives in a rough neighborhood, right? You've got the uh, neurovascular bundles for sexual function on the side, you've got the bladder on top, and you have the rectum behind. And we all know that treating early stage prostate cancer can be associated with uh, uh, morbidity in terms of those three domains of quality of life. And we also know that traditional radical therapies are not perfect. You can see on the left, after radical prostatectomy, at least a third of patients will have a biochemical recurrence. And after radiotherapy, uh, which uses a different uh, definition, uh, it's also in the same um, uh, you know, ballpark. So we all know that uh, surgery and radiotherapy are not perfect, and they also have morbidity. And clearly what we want to get is the best treatment that will maintain quality of life, particularly sexual function. I think urinary morbidity from surgery in particular is quite low, but we want to balance disease control and quality of life. And ideally, we uh, use the term a triple crown in our clinic. I know Peter Scardino referred to this as the trifecta, a patient cured, potent, and continent. And the sad fact is uh, the minority of patients we treat are actually like this. You can see here the data, it's upwards of 53%, but it's a highly selected cohort. Many of our men are coming in with, uh, you know, subtly impaired or moderately impaired erectile dysfunction, and uh, the outlooks for them, particularly with surgery, are not uh, particularly great, at least in, uh, in my experience. Now, here's the first um, um, sort of touchpad question, if you will, and the question is what temperature does high-intensity focus ultrasound achieve in targeted tissue? Uh, press A or 1 if it's between minus 30 and minus 40 degrees centigrade. 2 if it's between 50 and 69 degrees, that's positive centigrade. Plus C or 3 if it's between 70 and 89. Uh, D uh, or 4 if it's between 90 and 99. And uh, the final answer would be over 100 degrees. Can we have your answers, please? Okay. So um, we had one person who thinks this is a form of cryotherapy, um, but most think it's between 70 and 89 degrees. And in fact, the answer is about nine, between 90 and 99 degrees uh, centigrade. So the basic science of high intensity focus ultrasound, this is an acoustic ablation technique. Again, heats the tissue between 90 and 99 degrees centigrade, and it uh, destroys the targeted tissue at the focal point. And the best way I could describe this is by some freak of nature, when you pass low intensity, uh, sorry, high intensity ultrasound waves through an acoustic lens at the apex, imagine like a magnifying glass, you get intense heat, yet you don't get heat um, on the way up towards that apex. And that allows you to destroy tissue downstream or deeper uh, than you need to. In this case, it could be done on the rectum. And this is sort of how it's done with the sonoblate machine. I'll show you, there's a second uh, machine as well. But basically, the, you get these little pixels in three dimensions uh, where you get intense heat at the apex of that uh, particular uh, ultrasound, uh, focused ultrasound wave. And this is a temperature plot showing uh, what's happening where you can see that in the actual focal zone, you have 98 degrees kill, yet the rectal wall remains fairly uh, cool. Now, it's very important for you to recognize that this is not a set it and forget it type of machine. You can do a lot of damage with this machine and it requires a lot of um, uh, um, teaching. So there are two approved systems. There's the EDAP machine, which is on the left, and then there's the uh, US HIFU machine, uh, the sauna blade on the right. Uh, and in, in many ways, they are sort of two ways of packaging the same technology. There are subtle differences. The companies would like you to believe that one is particularly better than another, but I'm not sure there's any uh, solid data uh, suggesting that. Um, so here's the second question. Which of the following is not a major impediment in terms of a patient characteristic to deliver high food to your patients? So press one if it's pubic arch inter interference. Two, large prostate volume. Three, pre-existing brachytherapy seeds. Four, extensive dystrophic calcification. And five, severe anal stenosis. So let's have a vote, please. 
Okay, so most people got this right. This is not a transperineal um, delivery. It's a transrectal uh, delivery. So the only one that's not a major impediment here would be pubic arch interference. We're going transrectally, and uh, therefore that's not a problem. So what about patient selection? I mean, I think this has evolved, at least in our experience over the years. In theory, you could treat patients with localized disease, patients uh, with uh, locally recurrent disease, status post uh, radiotherapy, or patients uh, for focal therapy, and I'll touch on, on all of these. Uh, again, you'd like to have minimal calcifications in the prostate. If you ever see calcifications when you do ultrasound, you get a shadow behind it. If you get a shadow behind it, then the HIFU waves won't get behind it either. It's sonographic. It's the same co uh, concept as ultrasound. Um, for those of you who are, have, have never done this, basically the way it, it works is you have a transverse image uh, of the prostate, although you do get it in, 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 uh, as well as a sagittal. And what you do is you start anteriorly in the gland, you map the gland, and then you uh, fire uh, the, height, the heat treatment. There's a four centimeter focal length probe, and usually uh, you can do the anterior zone or the third floor that way. You often have a second floor, which can be done with the three or the four centimeter probe. And then you do the uh, the, the closest one to the rectum, and you always must use a three centimeter focal length uh, probe there. Um, the reason you start at the top is very simple. You get a lot of tissue change, edema, and it's difficult to see above it once you've treated it. So you've got to start high and work your way down. And if you're really lucky, and in most cases this is true, you can actually see evidence of tissue destruction. It's called popcorning. So what happens is you, almost like a kernel popping uh, when you're at the movie theater and you can see this big white blob. Uh, the top is the current image. This is the reference image. So you see you don't see any white in this particular area, but you see a white blob here, and that's effective popcorning. And what you'd like to see is uh, popcorning within the treatment field. And if you see uh, popcorning outside the treatment field, that's particularly dangerous. You can imagine being on the first floor uh, in the rectal service, and if you're getting this, then you can severely damage the rectum. Um, after HIFU, basically patients either have a Foley or a super uh, pubic tube, depending if you do whole gland or focal therapy, uh, and basically this is how we manage patients fairly stable. Uh, there's a new sort of, um, uh, if you will, trend towards doing visually directed HIFU, and basically the concept here is to treat and increase the energy, because you can adjust the energy, particularly on the sonoblate device, and you treat until you get popcorn. And this has been uh, one of the newer uh, changes to the treatment algorithms, and it's been shown in this particular publication that the Nader PSA values are better with that um, approach. Okay, here's the next uh, um, uh, question. What proportion of patients treated with whole gland HIFU require retreatment? So uh, get your touch pads again. Press uh, one if you think it cures everybody. Uh, two, uh, three to seven percent. C or three, 10 to 20 percent. D or four, 35 to 45 percent or lastly, 50 to 75%. Okay, so I, it, it, most people said 10 to 20%. The actual answer is about 40. And this is, if you're gonna do whole gland ablation, you need to warn a patient that there's a 40% chance you have to go back a second time. That's what the data seem to suggest. Uh, so that's an important statistic for all of you to know if you're gonna counsel your patients. So how are the clinical results? These are results with whole gland uh, ablation. Just to give you an idea, particularly in Europe and Asia, there are many patients, there are tens of thousands of patients have been treated with this modality. The key findings, basically negative biopsy rates in the best series, about 90%, probably realistically it's more around 70. And if depending on which biochemical disease free rate uh, um, equation you use. Most are using astrotype criteria. It seems to be do fairly well in low-risk uh, patients uh, and worse as you ratchet it up. There's not enough well-controlled data to tell us how this fares compared to radiation or surgery for sure. Uh, here's a paper from 2006. You can see here that with low risk, 84% of patients had negative biopsies. Uh, with high risk, it was 51%. Uh, and incontinence rates, however, are rare, and I'll talk about that in a second. Some more Japanese data, negative biopsy rate, 91 patients and 71 patients. And uh, there's also this uh, uh, data that's come out uh, from France. It's very popular in France. And I think the key here is that, oops, is that 
you have to understand that 36% of patients required two sessions, and that's got to be part of the, um, if you're going to do particularly whole gland, that's got to be part of the uh, discussion. Uh, but you could see here that basically 75% of patients were considered so-called successful, uh, and again, HIFU with a retreatment rate of 37%, uh, 39% can uh, typically um, treat at least half to 75% of the patients without major side effects. So the idea is almost to use this, not that it's as good as surgery or radiotherapy. I think that's a silly way of thinking about it. The fact is you can control a sizable proportion of individuals with less uh, toxicity. These are the Italian data uh, that have come out, 163 patients. You can see their median PSA value was 0.18, negative biopsy rate 73%. Uh, and uh, they had a particularly good uh, results. The PSA nadir is important. You can see here, if you correlate that with uh, biopsy results, if you're less than 0 0.2, you're pretty much doing well, uh, but as you get even greater than one, about half of the patients are gonna have a positive biopsy. This was our low-risk whole gland ex um, experience that we published some years ago, 65 patients, 78-month follow-up, and you can see that our post PSA, treatment, treatment PSA was 0.18. We have about a three of 65 or a 5% stricture rate. And ED was, was quite good at 11%, but we did have one rectal fistula. This was as we were learning. And uh, suffice to say, we haven't had one of these in quite a long uh, time. I must admit that personally, as a prostate cancer surgeon, when I saw some of the strictures and that one fistula in particular, I personally abandoned this treatment for whole gland. I no longer do whole gland ablation at all. I only use it now for focal therapy and for the rare uh, radiation failure. So let's talk about focal therapy. We're all familiar with some of the biologic bases of this, and this has been discussed. The pros, this concept of a dominant nodule, the fact genotypically that most metastases arise from that area, um, and of course the con is that prostate cancer is a multifocal disease. But I think with the evolution of MRI in particular, the last discussion, uh, we do have better ways to localize tumors um, than we did certainly in the pre-MRI uh, era. And, um, and I'll just go through this. So what are the therapeutic goals? How do we practice focal therapy with HIFU? It's all over the place, to be frank with you. We can do a subtotal ablation, a hemiablation. We could do a target with a halo around it in three dimensions. Uh, and some patients who have, we actually choose to treat only the seven with pre-existing six. The concept is getting them back to low risk. So there's a variety of different strategies that you can use around focal therapy, uh, depending on the patient's desires. Uh, and this is uh, probably the most recent one where uh, we can see the uh, results of uh, focal HIFU uh, for unilateral prostate cancer. This was published just in 2016, and it also shows the literature. Now, I think a couple of things to take home from this. Potency results are fantastic. Very few patients are going to have erectile dysfunction. Unlike unilateral nerve sparing surgery, that one nerve still gets beaten up a little bit. If you destroy one nerve with HIFU and the other nerve's fine, the patients are fine. The second is the urinary side effects are very minimal. You don't see the strictures and the contractures um, when you do focal therapy, probably because there's blood supply uh, coming in from the other side. But you can see here, that when, when we look at the results of this, you can see biopsy recurrence uh, in the AMID uh, series, about 11% at six months. And that's, I think, people are starting to see somewhere between 10 and 20% of patients have a positive biopsy. But the way to look at it is the complement. About 80% of patients will have a negative biopsy uh, at, a, at at least a year. And there's also newer evidence that if your MR is clear, you don't need a biopsy uh, at six months. Uh, and this is a, another um, series. This is using the EDAP machine. You can see here 50 patients with unilateral disease, eight-year follow-up. The BNED rate is 28% uh, using the uh, Phoenix criteria, uh, which is, again, um, it's, it, it's actually 72%. That's a typo. Continents, 94% and 83% potent. The problem in this series is very few patients were biopsied. Um, and you can see only eight, eight patients of the 50 ended up having a biopsy. Um, now, what about salvage? That's, I think, the last uh, major indication. Um, of course, these are troubling patients, right? Anytime you have to apply a second uh, treatment of patients with radiotherapy, the, the complication rates get ratcheted up. Uh, certainly, seeds are a contraindication. The same reason is because you can't deliver HIFU 
uh, up on top of the seeds because they create acoustic shadow. So uh, basically, if you look at some of the experience in the salvage setting, um, what things you got to worry about, stricture rate, uh, transient retention of continents, and also ischemic sloughing and need for TUR to clean up the prostatic urethra uh, can uh, um, uh, uh, arise. This was the Lepore data, and I haven't heard uh, much follow-up on it. These were 200 patients, part of their FDA registration for Gleason 6 and 7 uh, disease. We were part of this trial. Uh, patients had a six-month and one-year biopsy, and you can see Quite respectively, I th respectfully, I think here, 63% um, of patients had a negative biopsy. So I'm going to conclude and say that this technology is not perfect. You can do harm with it. You have to be trained on it. And we continue to learn and refine our techniques. Um, look, not all patients are cured, uh, whether we do surgery, HIFU, or radiotherapy. Do I think it's as good as surgery? For sure not but you can get away with keeping a, a sizable proportion of patients well with this technique. Now, whether that's, and it has to be the right patient who understands that, um, particularly because of the, in the focal space where morbidity and quality of life is minimally uh, impaired. It's an outpatient procedure. Uh, we need more data, clearly. And I think the best indications, as I mentioned, is focal therapy and radiation failures. Patients have large volume disease, Gleason 8 cancers, you know, bilateral disease. Don't offer them this therapy. I just don't think it's right. I'll just share with you one case about some other interesting stuff you can do with Haifu because I have two minutes left. This is a lawyer in my practice who's 73. I saw him in November 2015, initially diagnosed 2004, Gleason 6, 2 of 8 cores, PSA 2.74, had a radical prostatectomy by one of my partners at the time. Uh, and this shows his PSA trajectory, but you can see here, uh, he initially went undetectable in January 2005, but his PSA started to rise in 2009. Um, and he had salvage radiotherapy, um, and it um, didn't work. His PSA started to rise again. He had a very short sort of response to, to it. And his, when his PSA hit 0.4, not by myself, but he was started on intermittent angiogram suppression, wouldn't do it typically that long. But he's a very nervous guy. Um, but he had a horrible time on hormone therapy. Uh, he couldn't walk, severe uh, leg cramps at night, couldn't sleep, depression. And uh, this was a big problem. So I sent him off for a PET scan at the time to Mayo for a choline PET scan. And there was, there was basically uptake in his residual seminal vesicle. So they didn't, they, for whatever reason, they didn't target it at, at, during the salvage radiotherapy or just was radio refractory. And that was the only spot that, that was picked up on choline PET. So I went and biopsied a seminal vesicle remnant. And sure enough, the one that showed it showed some residual uh, Gleason 7 prostate cancer, his PSA is now 3.4, he's off hormones. So I actually high food his remnant seminal vesicle. These are the kind of things you could do. And believe it or not, he's been fine for about three years with a PSA of 0.04. So there's some other interesting things you can do with this technology, certainly surgery for a remnant seminal vesicle. He was offered a, uh, a radical prostatectomy, uh, a seminal vesiculectomy uh, by robotics at Mayo, which I thought after radiation was going to be uh, pretty much a fool's errand and probably fraught with a lot of downside. So I'll just conclude that this is an interesting technology. We have to learn more. Please be careful when you use it. If you're not careful, you're going to get fistulas. And from what I understand, I don't practice in a litigious environment. Apparently, a fistula is an automatic lawsuit no matter what you tell patients. So, um, but again, you can uh, use this technology safely, smartly, and with good effect. Thank you for your time.